Welcome back to another episode of Principles of Micro. Today we are still in Chapter 14, looking at supply and demand for resources. So here we're looking at the market for land in this episode. Now, I left out land from being one of the factors of production because most books don't consider land to be a major factor of production. Most books just look at labor and capital being the main inputs. However, I will reintroduce land over here because the market for land is a little bit different. So that difference could be worth knowing about because other markets could be similar in some ways. So without any further ado, let's look at the market for land. So what's weird about land, the supply of land is typically fixed with a few exceptions. Your book talks about um, artificial islands being built in some places, but that is very much the exception rather than the rule. Most of the time, most of the planet, the amount of land available is going to be fixed. So as a result, it's going to simplify our analysis a little bit. We only have to worry about demand shifts rather than supply and demand shifts. So here's one example that I'm very much familiar with. So I grew up in the Seattle area. I still know a lot of people in there and my family is still out there. So one big story in Seattle recently has been the growth of Amazon. That's not just the whole coronavirus shutdown causing them to hire more workers in their warehouses. They've been growing well before that and growing quite rapidly. So their company is headquartered in Seattle and they've been hiring a lot of workers. And my question for you to analyze is how does this affect the price of land in Seattle? So go ahead and pause the video here while you work that out. When you're ready with the answer, press play. All right, I assume you have worked through the problem by now. Those workers in, for Amazon have to live somewhere. So they end up buying land or, and that's going to increase demand for land in Seattle. Um, they could also be renting apartments, but that means that the landlords who are building these apartments have to buy more land in order to build them. So either way, demand for land is going up somehow. It could be from workers buying homes or it could be from landlords buying property for new apartment complexes. So demand is definitely going up. What that does is that it's going to increase the price of land in Seattle. So you will not be surprised to hear that land in Seattle has gotten a lot more expensive in the last decade or so. So equilibrium price rises. Now the equilibrium quantity is going to be unchanged. That's because there's still a fixed amount of land in Seattle. Now in most other markets, we get more demand. That also boosts quantity because here supply is fixed. Quantity does not change. That's something that's a little bit idiosyncratic about the land market for land compared to most other goods. So rent is really, really high in Seattle and it's gotten even more expensive. There've been predictable effects with congestion being worse and worse and rush hour. Um, just don't try to drive in Seattle during rush hour unless you have a lot of time on your hands. So it very much follows our predict the predictions of our economic model. Um, that actually wraps up our section on the market for land. Very short section because you only look at demand shifts, not supply shifts. So let's finish up our chapter and look at the market for capital in this episode as well. So our capital refers to the machines or equipment in a factory. A major consideration for the firm is the marginal product of capital. This is abbreviated as MPK. Now, we know how to spell the word capital. We know it because of the C, not a K. Nevertheless, the standard abbreviation is MPK, not MPC. The reason for that is that we typically reserve the word, the letter C for consumption. Consumption is also a pretty big deal in economics. If you use C to both, mean both consumption and capital, that would create confusion. So what this book does, and also what just about every other book out there also does, is reserve C for consumption and K for capital. So the MPK is the change in output 
when you add one more machine to your firm. Uh, that's an approximation. You'll see a more precise definition in intermediate micro if you're going to take that. Watch out for these MPK myths. So the MPK does not, again, MPK does not refer to average output per machine. A lot of my students think that, but it is not true. Do not fall for that trap. Another myth to watch out for, MPK is not number of machines per worker. That is also not true. So this happens just about every semester. I ask my students about this on exams. A lot of people fall for these myths, but to be clear, you were warned. The MPK is not our type of machine. It's not in our machines per worker. So don't be upset at me when you missed that exam question. I tried to warn you. MPK is change in output when one more machine is added. So hopefully you didn't fast forward through this. I know I've just been repeating myself a lot, but it's a really big deal. I don't want to see you guys mess up easy questions. All right, I'll stop hammering away at that and move on. So a simple numeric example, numerical example of how the MPK works. So let's say we have no machines, you have no output. If you were to add one machine to your factory, that output's gonna be 30. So MPK is gonna be 30 as well because output is risen by 30. If you go from one machine to having two machines, output's gonna be 50 now. That's an increase of 20, so your MPK is going to be 20. If you add a third machine, output goes up to 60. So 50 plus 10 is 60, MPK is gonna be 10. And lastly, we have a fourth machine, output's gonna be 65 in total, that means the MPK is gonna be 5. 60 plus 5 is 65. So in your um, smart work problems or on your Blackboard homework problems, really presented in this way, the table looks like, like this. Your textbooks tables look a little bit different though. So I'll just compare that briefly. Oh, sorry. I guess I did not have that slide in there after all. So your textbook shows it in a way as similar to the MPL. So I already said earlier, with our MPL example that, where is it? Ah, here we are. So the MPL, your book, uh, with the MPL, your homework problems will look like this, but your book's format is like this. So they put the MPL in between the number of workers. Similar with the MPK, your book shows the MPK being a row in between the number of machines. So that's there, but your problems will look more like this one. So this is the format to focus on, be sure you can work through problems in that format. Moving on. All right, here we are. We look at where does the firm's demand for machines come from? or you might call it the firm's derived demand. So three factors go into that. The firm cares about what is the marginal product of capital, the MPK. How productive is that last machine going to be? They also care about the price of the firm's product. So the price of the firm's product goes up, they're gonna to want to buy more machines to produce more. Now the price goes down, they're gonna produce less and that's gonna require them to buy fewer machines. So that also plays a role in the firm's demand for capital. There's also the rental rate for the machine, which we'll call R. So in economic models, we often have the firm renting their machine. This might strike you as being unrealistic because in the real world, don't firms buy their machine? However, you can still justify this approach. So if I'm buying a machine, I gotta think about the opportunity cost. We talked about opportunity cost way back in chapter one. Let me just refresh your memory on how that works. Opportunity cost is a really big deal in economics, so definitely one of the big takeaways from this course. Opportunity cost is the value of the next best option. So if your firm was not spending that money on the machine, 
what could they be doing instead? Well, they could be putting that money in the bank and earning interest. So perhaps that opportunity cost of interest rate they could be getting instead, that could be R. And that would be still a factor in their consideration for if they want to buy a machine or not. You could also look at another way. You could view the firm as being owned by its shareholders and you pay a dividend R to the firm's shareholders. So it still makes sense to model the firms as renting capital, even if in the real world they're purchasing their capital. So derived for demand for capital is going to be given by the fine equation. It's going to be the rental rate equals the value of the marginal product. So in the context of the market for capital, the value of the marginal product means the price of the final good multiplied by the marginal product of capital. So it's very similar to something we saw earlier in a previous episode. We saw derived demand for labor was wage equals P times MPL. We'll establish this is optimal by the same kind of process. We'll look at what if we had the rental rate being less than the value of the marginal product. So what if the rental rate were $100, but the price is 20 and the MPK is 7. So the MPK is 7, that means that one extra machine produces 7 more units of output. If the price is 20, then we can figure out what is the value of those 7 extra units. 7 times 20 works out to 140. That means that one extra machine is going to bring in an extra $140 in revenue. The cost of that extra machine is just $100. So if we rent out one more machine, our revenues rise by 140, our costs rise by 100, that means our profit is going to rise by 40. Same reasoning as before, if it's possible to increase your profit, then your original decision was not profit maximizing. So that means the firms is not going to have R less than P times, MP, P times MPK because that would not be profit maximizing. That lets us rule out this case. Next possibility, what if the rental rate were bigger than P times MPK? So that could be something like the rental rate being 90 and the price is 10, MPK is 8. So what does that kind of translate to? Well, the MPK is 8, what that means in regular English is that the very last machine we rented produced 8 extra units. If the price is 10, then the value of those 8 units will be $80. 8 times 10 is 80. So that last machine gave us a benefit of $80. The cost of the last machine was the rental rate, and that cost was $90. So in this case, the costs outweigh the benefits. Renting out that last machine was not worth it. Overall, that last machine is dragging down our profits. So that can't be the right decision. That means we can rule out our being bigger than P times MPK. So if we eliminate both R being greater than the value of the marginal product and R being less than the value of the marginal product, the last remaining case is you must have R equals P times MPK. That gives you the firm's derived demand for capital, very much similar to derived demand for labor. So capital is also subject to the law of diminishing marginal returns. So the marginal product capital is going to be decreasing. That gives you a downward sloping demand curve for capital. So here's our graph. Looks like a regular supply and demand graph with different axes. So with supply and demand, you normally have price up here and you have quantity over there. Well, the quantity of capital is K because K is the number of machines. 
the price of capital is the rental rate. We said the rental rate is just R. So that's why we put R on the y-axis. So it's very much mirroring price and quantity from a regular supply and demand diagram. Equilibrium is, as usual, where supply and demand meet. The equilibrium rental rate is R star. Equilibrium in our machines is K star. So let's work through an example to make sure we understand how this stuff works. So let's say the price of the firm's final product is going up. How is that going to affect the capital market? So go ahead and figure out which curve shifts and which direction and find what happens to R star and also find what happens to K star. So pause the video, work through the problem, and then press play when you're done. All right, I'll assume you have finished the problem by now. So let's talk about the answer. So the derived demand is price times marginal product capital. So if price goes up, that means the firm's demand for capital is also going to go up. So if P goes up, P times MPK also goes up. Demand is going to shift out. We start at D0 back here, but now we're going to be at D1 out there. So old equilibrium is where old demand meets supply. That gave us this rental rate and this quantity of machines. The new equilibrium is where the new demand curve intersects supply, and that happens at this point. So we have this rental rate, and we have this amount of machines. So if you compare, you can see that the rental rate has gone up, and also the number of machines has also go up, gone up. That should not be a big surprise. If your good becomes more valuable, you want to produce more of it, to produce more of it, you have to buy more machines. So that's why capital goes up when price goes up. That extra demand for machines will cause the rental rate to rise. It will cause the price of the machines to also go up. So that should not be a surprise either. All right, class, that finishes up Chapter 14. So we'll stop there. Be sure to tune in for our next episode where we learn about behavioral economics a very interesting and exciting topic.